Great, thank you very much. Um, seems like, okay, I'm, I'm mic'd, everything is okay. Um, I'm, again, very pleased to be here, and I, I want to um, thank again the Whitney Humanities Center for its extraordinary generosity and uh, the entire staff for making this um, <clears throat> a really pleasant and um, enriching time for me. I've enjoyed my conversations already with many of you, and tomorrow morning, I gather, we will have more of an open uh, question and answer period um, uh, with um, Paul North and Jason Stanley, and um, and I'm hoping you might still have the energy or desire to uh, show up again so that I might learn your views. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yesterday I sought to engage psychoanalysis with both moral philosophy <clears throat> and social theory, intimating that some of our ethical and political debates make tacit demographic presuppositions about who poses the moral question and those about whom the moral question is posed. We cannot even pose the question whose lives are to be safeguarded without making some assumptions about whose lives are considered potentially grievable lives. For lives that do not count as potentially grievable stand very little chance of being safeguarded. My suggestion last time <clears throat> was that psychoanalysis helps us to see how phantasms can function as uncritical dimensions of our moral deliberations. And today we will pay some attention to what we might call population phantasms as a way of understanding tacit, even unconscious forms of racism that underscore some of our more deliberate reflections on violence and nonviolence. <clears throat> Earlier I sought to show that moral debates on nonviolence can take two significantly different forms. The first centers on the question of the grounds for not killing or destroying another or others in the plural, and the second on the question of what obligations we have to preserve the life of the other or others. We can ask what stops us from killing, but we can also ask what motivates us actively to find moral or political pathways that seek where possible to preserve life. Whether or not we pose such questions about individual others, specific groups, or all possible others matters greatly since what we take for granted about the nature of individuals and groups, and even the ideas of humanity that we invoke in such discussions, very often demographic assumptions, including fantasies about who counts as a human, which lives are worth preserving and which lives are not, and what defines and limits our operative notions of humanity. <clears throat> Etymologically considered, demography is the study of the way that people, demos, are written, graphos, or represented. And though sometimes that is associated with statistics, that is only one of the graphic means by which populations are discursively elaborated. By what graphic means would we distinguish between the grievable and the ungrievable? <clears throat> I suggested that the category of grievable lives might be useful as we seek to elaborate an idea of the equal value of lives, and that considering the unequal distribution of grievability might be one framework for understanding the differential production of the human, of who counts as human. To claim that equality formally extends to all humans is to sidestep the fundamental question of how the human is produced. We might say that for equality to make sense as a concept, it must imply that formal extension to all humans. And, but, um, um, <clears throat> but even then, when we make an assumption about who is included within the category of the human and who is partially included or fully excluded. For that reason, we cannot take the human as the ground of our analysis. It is a concept differentially articulated in the context of inegalitarian forms of social and political power. And because the field of the human is constituted through basic exclusions, it is haunted by the figures that do not count in its tally. In effect, I am asking how the unequal distribution of grievability enters into and distorts our deliberate ways of thinking about violence and nonviolence. One might expect that a consideration of grievability pertains only to those who are dead, but my contention 
is that grievability is operative in life, that it is a characteristic attributed to living creatures, marking their value within a differential scheme and bearing directly on the question of whether or not they are treated equally and in a just way. I suggested as well that violent potential emerges as a feature of all relations of interdependency and that a concept of the social bond that takes interdependency as a constitutive feature is one that perpetually reckons with forms of ambivalence, ones that Freud understood as emerging from the conflict between love and hate. Of course, I understand that many people will have an aversion to any discussion at all of something called the social bond, as if there were a single one. My aim is not to claim that all social relations in their historical and political diversity can be reduced to a singular sort of bond, not at all. My claim is rather that whenever we seek to consider specific historical relations, we can surely ask about the status of ambivalence in those relations, especially when those relations have involved dependency or interdependency. We may have all sorts of other reasons for thinking about social relations, but insofar as they are characterized by interdependency, it becomes possible, in my view, to ask about ambivalence and disavowal, not only as features of psychic reality, but as features of social relations. And this opens up the problem of violence within that relational frame, designating that convergence that we might call the psychosocial. Of course, that does not mean that we think about violence only in that way, or even that it is the best way. As we will see, there are differences between, say, physical, legal, and institutional violence that have to be understood. My wager in these lectures is that we might gain some insight into the way that demographic assumptions pervade our debates about violence, and how this happens through certain phantasmatic operations internal to our deliberate efforts, our deliberative efforts. And further, I hope to suggest that to recognize the unequal distribution of the grievability of lives can and should transform our debates about equality. Although it is possible to pose these sorts of questions in the first person, and that is often the way that moral deliberation works, it would be wrong, I think, to um, think that deliberating human agents are the source of all the forms of agency that produce the differential grievability of lives. In the final chapter of Foucault's 1976 lecture course, translated as Society Must Be Defended, as you know, the title is in quotation marks in English and in French, he elaborates on the emergence of the biopolitical field in the 19th century. There we find that the biopolitical describes the operation of power over humans as living beings. Distinct from sovereign power, biopolitics or biopower appears to be a distinctively European formation. It operates through various technologies and methods for managing life, but also death. For Foucault, it is a distinct kind of power inasmuch as it is exercised over humans by virtue of their status as living beings. Sometimes he calls that living status a biological status, though he does not tell us which version of biological science he has in mind at that moment. Foucault describes the biopolitical as a power to make live or to let die, but also as the power to take life or let live. As in many instances in his work, power acts, but not from a sovereign center. There are multiple agencies of power operating in a post-sovereign context to manage populations as living creatures, to manage their lives, to make them live or let them die. This form of biopower regulates, among other things, the very livability of life, determining the relative life potential of populations. This sort of power is documented in mortality and natality rates that indicate forms of racism that belong to biopolitics. And here I quote Ruth Wilson Gilmore as a perfect example. Um, she writes, racism specifically is the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Uh, in other words, racism can be documented by who, which populations are more likely to suffer premature deaths than others. 
It emerges as well in the forms of pronatalism and pro, so-called pro-life positions that regularly privilege some sorts of life or living tissue over others, such as teenage or adult women. Important for our purposes is Foucault's claim that there is no a priori right to life, that a right to life first must be established in order to be exercised. Under conditions of political sovereignty, for instance, a right to life, and even a right over one's own death, comes to exist only for those who have already been constituted as rights-bearing subjects. Under biopolitical conditions, the right to life is much more ambiguous, since power manages populations rather than distinct subjects who are subjected to sovereign power. Additionally, the relation of the biopolitical to matters of life and death is different from what he calls the relationships of war. War logics follow the dictum, and here I'm quoting him, if you want to live, you must take lives, you must be able to kill. Um, and he writes, he doesn't write with the vous or the tu, he, reads, he uses the French en, which is, of course, ambiguously singular and plural, so it's unclear whether war follows from self-preservation or group preservation. He formulates the basic maxim of war at least twice, in order to live, the other must die. In the first version, you yourself have to be prepared to kill, and killing is a means to preserve your own life. In the second version, in order to live, the other must die, but you yourself do not have to be the one who takes that life. This opens the way to other technologies and procedures by which lives can be abandoned or let to die without any one assuming responsibility for the action. <clears throat> the way race enters war, or indeed the way in which state racism enters into wars, operating through biopolitical logics, is more difficult to discern in this view. Foucault has separated the biopolitical from the idea of warfare to the extent that he claims that biopower has a different relation to death. He writes that death does not swoop down, but regulates life and death through other kinds of managerial and institutional logics. The days of death swooping down are not exactly over, even if sometimes Foucault writes as if they were to foreground another kind of power characteristic of the present. For him, power and violence are now more indirect, less spectacular, less orchestrated by state violence. Of course, he's writing in the 1970s. It's more difficult to separate sovereign power from the biopolitical, a point that he himself would make in subsequent lectures, and we should suspect any effort to establish a neat historical sequence in which the one, the biopolitical, clearly follows upon the other, the sovereign. This is especially the case if the sequence depends on a progressive version of modern European history, one that, by the way, does not take account of European wars suffered and waged during the last century. What happens if a life is considered not to be living at all? That is to say, what happens if it does not register as a life? If Foucault could claim very clearly that a right to life belongs only to a subject who is already constituted as a rights-bearing subject, one for whom life is a necessary right, can we not also then claim that the status of a living being must first be constituted for someone to become a subject with the right to life? If racism is a way of, as he put it, introducing a break into the domain of life that is under power's control, then perhaps we can think of that break as not merely distinguishing between superior and inferior types within the idea of the species, but also uh, between those who are considered to be living and those who are either non-living or perhaps particip participating in a kind of social death. After all, if a non-living population is destroyed, that is to say a population that is considered to be non-living, is destroyed, then nothing of note has happened. There is no destruction, just a certain clearing away of an obstruction from the path of the truly living. Foucault anticipates that critics from the field of political theory will ask about his account of life. He recedes from this debate, fearing perhaps that it would commit him to a vitalism or to a foundationalist account of life that precedes contract sovereignty and the biopolitical. He writes, all this is a debate within political philosophy that we can leave on one side, he writes, 
but it clearly demonstrates how the problem of life came to be problematized within the field of political thought. Well, the issue cannot quite be set aside, but not because there are some assumptions about the form of life that precedes the domain of power. In my view, power is already operating through schemas of racism that persistently distinguish not only between lives that are more or less valuable, more or less grievable, but also between lives that register more or less emphatically as lives. A life can register as a life only within a schema that presents it as such. The epistemological nullification or foreclosure of the living character of a population, the very definition of a genocidal epistemology, structures the field of the living along a continuum that has concrete implications for the question, whose are the lives that are worth preserving? Whose lives matter? Whose lives are grievable? To ask this question is to confront from the start uh, the particular historico-racial schema, a term prominently used by Franz Fanon in Black, Skins, White Mas Black Skin, White Masks. It's a schema that functions as a form of perception and projection, an interpretive casing that enfolds the black body and orchestrates its social negation. In fact, Fanon distinguishes between the historic racial schema and the epidermal racial schema, which fixes an essence to black life, but it's the first of these, the historic racial schema, that seems to bear a di direct relation to Merleau-Ponty's idea of a corporeal schema and to the schemas of racism that bear on the question of grievability. A corporeal schema for Merleau-Ponty is the organization of tacit and structuring bodily relations with the world, but also the operation of constituting oneself within the terms made available by that world. The historical racial schema, according to Fanon, is to be found at a deeper level, and it comes to disrupt the idealized corporeal schema proposed by Merleau-Ponty. The elements of the historic racial schema are provided by what he calls the white man, a figure for the powers of racism, that casts black bo body bodily experience of the world into certain uncertainty. On the one hand, he writes, a third-person consciousness enters into a first-person consciousness, so one's very mode of perception is riven by another consciousness. Who is seeing when I am seeing, and when I see myself, am I seeing only through the eyes of another? On the other hand, the corporeal schema describes a way of composing oneself from the elements of the world, out of the elements of the world. Fanon describes this aspirational schema and I quote, as a slow composition of myself as a body in the middle of a spatial and temporal world. The powerful figure of what he calls the white man is the one, and I quote again, who had woven me out of a thousand details, anecdotes, stories. So as he writes, he retells having been written or woven by the third person, and we see on the page the so slow struggle of self-composition that follows upon the decomposition of the bodily schema through the working of racism. It is at the level of the bodily experience of oneself in a world where that schema is taken apart, expropriated, inhabited, occupied, and decomposed. It is at that level that this racism operates. Now, of course, Fanon uses the first and the third person figures such as the black man and the white man to articulate this idea of the schema. But the historic racial schema is broader and more diffuse than those particular figures. In fact, such a schema bears upon the living and embodied life of populations and so provides a critical supplement to Foucault's reflections on anti-black racism and biopower. Such a historic racial schema precedes and informs as well policies on world health, hunger, refugees, migration, culture, occupation, and other colonial practices, police violence, incarceration, the death penalty, intermittent bombardment and destruction, war, and genocide. Although Foucault identifies state racism at the end of these lectures as one of the central instruments for the management um, of the life and death of populations, Foucault does not tell us precisely how racism works to establish relative values for different lives. There is, of course, a clear sense that some populations are targeted by modes of sovereign power, 
and that there is a letting die orchestrated by biopower, but how do we account for the differential ways in which lives and deaths matter or fail to matter? If we take racialization as the process by which a racial schema is materialized at the level of our conceptualization of what is living and what is not, then how do such basic differentials enter into military and policy debates regarding targeted populations and incarcerated peoples? And in what ways do they operate as a set of uncritically accepted presuppositions, racial schemas, in our own debates about violence and nonviolence? At the end of Society Must Be Defended, Foucault opens up the possibility that populations who are precarious or abandoned are not yet constituted as subjects of rights and that for understanding who they are, that is to say the way they are constituted within the political field, we need an alternative to the model of the subject. Right? The whole idea of population can't be reduced to the notion of the subject. So what is the, what, what, what language do we use? How do we describe population outside the language of the subject? In the lectures that follow the birth of biopolitics, he shifts directions and focuses on neoliberalism, distinguishing between the juridical subject and the subject of interest. So he goes back to the idea of the subject. He, he opened a direction to think about state re racism and modes of agency and resistance that emerge from populations that cannot be described as the acts of individual or as collective subjects. But then sadly, that direction ended up not being the path that Foucault would take. I have a suggestion about how we might continue that abandoned project if, as Foucault has argued, under sovereign power a subject has a right to life only on the condition that the subject is constituted as a rights-bearing subject, then under conditions of biopower a population has a claim to life on the condition that the population is registered as potentially grievable. This is my thesis, my way of offering a supplement to Foucault by bringing Fanon to bear on the question of how racial schemas enter into the racial figurations of what is living, who is living, and how racial phantasms inform the demographic, demographic valuations of who is grievable, whose lives ought to be preserved, whose can be expunged or left to die. Of course, there is a vast continuum and populations can be grieved in one context and remain unmarked in another, and modes of grieving may be acknowledged while others are dismissed or go unrecognized. And still, the dominant schemas by which the value of life is allocated rely on a modulating of grievability, whether or not that metric is ever named. The historical racial schema that makes it possible to claim this is or was a life, or these are or were lives, is intimately bound up with the possibility of necessary modes of valuing life, memorialization, safeguarding, recognition, the preservation of life. This is a life worth living, worth preserving, and these are lives that ought to be given the condition to live and to be registered and recognized as lives. The phantasmagoria of racism is part of that racial schema that makes it impossible or difficult to make such simple claims, which should be simple claims, but are not simple claims. We can see how this works as a, as a thought sequence crystallized in the moving images that enter into deliberate, deliberative pro processes to negate the life claim of the person whose life is at stake, how the phantasmagoria of racism operates within the metric of grievability. It does so, for instance, in the sequence in which a person, such as James Garner, is put into a police chokehold and then audibly announces he cannot breathe and visibly can be seen not to be able to breathe, and it is registered by everyone at the scene that he will not survive the prolongation of that police chokehold, which then, after the announcement, strengthens to become a stranglehold, strangulation, murder. Does the policeman who strengthens the hold to the point of death imagine that the person about to die is actually about to attack? Or that his own life is endangered? Or is it simply that this life is one that can be snuffed out because it is not considered a life, never was a life, does not fit the norm of life that belongs to the racial schema, hence it does not register as a grievable life, a life worth preserving? Or when Walter Scott in South Carolina turning his back to the police unarmed clearly frightened, ran in the opposite direction from the police, 
How did he become phantasmagorically turned around, made into a threatening figure to be killed? Perhaps there in the moment of decision or action, um, uh, we can see something that belongs to a race war logic. The policeman believes it is his life rather than the other's life that is endangered. Perhaps this is simply the violent moment of a biopolitical apparatus, a way of managing that life unto death. In this case, the black man is simply there, vulnerable to being killed, and so is killed as if he were prey and the police were hunters. So when unarmed black men or women or queer and transgender people have their backs turned to the police and are walking or running away and are still gunned down by police, an action often later defended as self-defense, even as a defense of society, how are we to understand that? Is that turning of the head or walking or running away actually construed as an aggressive advance anticipated by the police? The police person who decides to shoot or who simply finds himself shooting may or may not be deliberating, but it surely seems that a phantasm has seized upon that thought process inverting the figures and the movement he sees to justify in advance any lethal action he may take. The violence that the police is about to do, the violence he then commits, has already moved toward him in a figure, a racialized ghost, condensing and inverting his own aggression, wielding his own aggression against himself, acting in advance of his own plans to act, legitimating and elaborating, as if in a dream, his later argument of self-defense before a court. The frame for this violence has to be, of course, expanded to forms of violence that target race and gender at once. <clears throat> and so uh, to see that sometimes the violence against black women in particular takes place in different scenes and different sequences of events and with differing consequences. The report called Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women, published in July 2015 by the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, led by Kimberly Crenshaw and Andrea Ritchie, makes clear that the main examples in the media illustrating police violence against black people in the United States nearly all involve black men, showing that the dominant frames for understanding anti-black racism and police violence operate within a restrictive gender framing. Calling for a gender-inclusive approach to racial justice, Crenshaw has independently drawn attention to the way that black women are over-policed and underprotected, but also how their injuries and deaths are not as fully documented or registered, even within the social movements explicitly focused on, op on opposing police violence. To bring that problem into visibility, we would have to account for the various ways that black women face death in their encounters with police, whether on the street, in their homes, or in detention. There are the women stopped for traffic violations who then end up shot. Gabriela Navarez in Sacramento in 2014, or Chantel Davis in Brooklyn in 2012, or Melissa Williams in Ohio in 2012, or Latanya Haggerty in Chicago in 1999. And then, of course, in July 2015, Sandra Bland was pulled over for failing to signal when changing lanes, charged with assault and held in jail in Waller County, Texas, only then to be found dead in her cell three days later. It remains unclear whether that was a suicide or a murder. Worth noting as well are the number of black women killed when police are called to intervene in domestic disputes. The police claim the women were aggressive or wielding knives, which may or may not be true, but in some instances, it seems that the failure to obey a police order results in being shot. It is not always a direct killing that takes a life. A call for a doctor to help with asthma goes unanswered, and Shanek Proctor dies in a prison cell in Bessemer, Alabama in 2014. Over-policed, black women are often figured as aggressive, dangerous, out of control, or drug mules underprotected, their own calls for help often go unheeded or scorned as do their calls for medical or psychiatric treatment. All of these forms of taking life or letting life go are not just concrete examples of how the metric of grievability works, determining and distributing the grievability and value of lives. These are the concrete operations of the metric itself, its technologies, its points of application, 
And in these instances, we see the convergence of the biopolitical logic of the historic racial schema and the phantasmagoric inversions that occlude the social bond. What may appear as an isolated act of violence or the expression of an individual psychopathology shows itself to be part of a pattern, a punctual moment within a reiterated practice of violence. That practice relies upon and consolidates a racial schema in which aggression becomes justified through a logic that draws upon the phantasmagoric inversion of aggression that functions not only as a potential defense, but as the effective moralization of murder, a racial schema in which the living status of a black person that is already not registered within the perceptual field of the grievable is snuffed out because it did not register as a life, a life worth preserving. The, the killing becomes a way of facilitating the death of those considered to be socially dead or those who should be socially dead according to those who want them dead. Um, but also we might say uh, um, that those who are targeted have an obstinate way of trying to continue to live and that apparently is offensive to those who want them dead. We may conclude that a stronger and more just sense of law should be brought to bear on such instances and I have no doubt that better law is obligatory. But to argue in that way, we have first to know what the relation is between violence and law. Should we look to law to provide an alternative to violence? We cannot readily accept the idea that violence is overcome once we make the transition from a pre-legal sociality to a legal order. As we know, there are fascist and racist legal regimes that immediately discount that view. We could say that those are instances of bad law, or we could say that those regimes are not really law and then offer a normative stipulation of what law should be through a description uh, of what it really is. But I'm not sure that any of those particular moves, worthy, worthy as they may be, address the fundamental questions. How does the legally binding character of law require and institute coercion? And how is this form of coercion distinguishable from legal violence, if it is? Over and against the view that law establishes civil relations based on freedom and that war establishes coercive conditions for conduct, Walter Benjamin clearly identifies the coercion at the heart of legal regimes as violence. His view is taken up or at least echoed by Robert Cover, who was of course uh, a legal scholar here at Yale and he was primarily concerned with the act of legal interpretation as carrying its own violence. He argued, and I quote, the relationship between legal interpretation and the infliction of pain remains operative even in the most routine of legal acts. It's perhaps most clear in the act of sentencing, a speech act with the power to imprison someone for life or even to take his or her life away. For as the judge interprets the law, and sentencing is the pronunciation of the interpretation that the judge arrives at, the judge acts to initiate and give justification for a punishment that then involves the police and prison guard who restrain, hurt, render helpless, kill, or fatally abandon the prisoner. So the speech act is not separate from those other acts. It's the initial moment of that violent process and so very much a violent act. After claiming that legal interpretation is a form of bonded interpretation, Cover makes a controversial claim and I quote, if people disappear, if they die suddenly and without ceremony in prison, quite apart from any articulated justification and authorization for their demise, then we do not have constitutional interpretation at the heart of this deed, nor do we have the deed, the death, at the heart of the Constitution, end quote. What if the death in prison could have been prohibited and the law failed to take the necessary steps? Is there not a constitutional protection for those who die in prison to receive the assistance and resources they need to stay alive? In other words, if prison deals death not only through the death penalty, but also through more or less systematic forms of neglecting some lives rather than others, it seems that a few obligatory legal protections have surely not been honored, even those that may well engage constitutional rights. Of course, it deals death slowly and quickly, prison does. It also manages life and so maintains life in ways that devalue life. In this sense, again, the loss of grievability characterizes the living and surely constitutes some part of unjust and unequal treatment. Cover insisted that judges are engaged in violence in their interpretive acts, including their speech acts. 
however much they understand themselves as conducting business at a distance from the grimmer realities of prison. They are part of the same violent system. He concluded that this violence is to be accepted and organized in ways that are justified. He proposed to that, and I quote, to do that violence safely and effectively, responsibly, responsibility for the violence must be shared, and that, I quote again, many actors must be brought into this concerted action. Fundamentally, then, he distinguishes between just and unjust violent legal regimes. Violence should not be random, and it should not be generated by only one actor in his view. He was interested in how to think about the conduct of judges, but his views extend to how we think about violence as suffusing the legal system. We do not leave a lawless world of violence to enter into a legal world that operates without violence. Legal violence is there not only in sentencing practices, linked as they are with the practices of punishment and incarceration, but also in the binding character of the law. We are enjoined and proscribed by the law, and in doing so, the threat of legal violence is already underway, for if we fail to follow the law, the law will lay hold of us. Cover does not easily let us make a distinction between coercion and violence, the former posited as justified, the latter as unjustifiable. On the contrary, in his view, there are only better and worse forms of legal violence. For Benjamin, too, especially in his A Critique of Violence, originally published in 1921, the binding character of law on the, sub on the subject is an operation of violence. Benjamin argued prior to Cover that the relevant distinction is not between law that is coercive and crime as violence, but between legal and non-legal forms of violence. Unlike Cover, Benjamin thought that legal violence should be opposed and that challenging the binding character of the law on the subject is one way toward a broader revolutionary change. There's much to be said here, and what Benjamin ended up calling divine violence is notoriously controversial. But there's a narrower point worth considering. For Benjamin, the mistake is to consider that legal violence, precisely because it is legal, is justified, and that forms of resistance to legal regimes, precisely because they are not based on existing law, are therefore criminal or violent. In his view, a legal regime produces a framework in which justification makes sense, and actions that contest that regime are deemed violent because they do not conform to that framework. They even call that framework into question. So in a critique of violence, what one calls violence depends upon the legal constraints imposed upon justification. There is no way to name something as either violent or nonviolent without at once invoking the framework in which that designation makes sense. Now that may seem like a form of relativism. What you call violence, I do not call violence, and so on. But I want to suggest it's actually something quite different. In Benjamin's view, legal violence regularly renames its own violent character as justifiable coercion or legitimate force, but these terms sanitize the violence at issue. The renaming practice and the justification tend to be articulated through a story form that narrates the transition from pre-contractual sociability to the social contract. People come together in a pre-contractual condition, usually after some violent conflicts have come to light. In Rousseau, it's always different people wanting water from the well or deciding this is my land. Um, and they decide what it, that it really would be better for them on the basis of their self-interest or their common interest to impose a common set of laws upon themselves. They then enter into this founding contract or compact freely submitting to laws, and this voluntary subjection establishes the force of the self-legislated law as a legitimate one, even an exercise of political and moral autonomy. Benjamin documents what happens to terms such as violence and nonviolence once we understand that the frameworks within which their definitions are secured are oscillating. He remarks that a legal regime that seeks to monopolize violence must call every threat or challenge to that regime a violent one. Hence, it can rename its own violence as necessary or obligatory force, justifiable coercion, and because it works through the law as the law, it is legal and hence justified. So within that framework, one that Benjamin actually calls fate, whose tautological formula is that the law is justified because it is the law, 
and as justified, its own violence is justified, and its own established legal framework is the one with the authority to establish frameworks of justification within which what is justified is distingu distinguished from what is unjustified. So what he's done is to, to say that, the, that when we ask the question of which forms of violence are justified, we have to also ask a prior question, what is the justificatory scheme to which we refer when we start to make that decision, and is it itself produced by the legal regime that is negotiating and adjudicating the question? Um, now, the legal regime that's negotiating and adjudicating the question has an interest in reproducing itself and its authority, so it decides what is justifiable and non-justifiable violence, and those forms of resistance to the legal regime itself will always be understood as violent, no matter what physical form they take, precisely because they seek to delegitimate the law, its framework, and its justificatory schemes. Legitimacy, though, is in this scenario that Benjamin gives us, um, derived from the tautology that the law is the law, right? The legal regime establishes the justificatory scheme that defends and sanitizes its own legal violence at the same time that it names as violent that which threatens that regime. So even to question what gives a particular regime its legitimacy, unclear whether we can ask that question in public anymore, but let's imagine we still could. What gives a particular regime its legitimacy is understood to be a violent speech act, a violent act, an act of destruction. And the reason is because all questions of legitimacy and justification can be formulated only within the framework of legal violence that is the first stipulation of legal violence. So it's not only the loss of the monopoly on violence that the legal regime counters so forcefully, and with the accusation that violence is directed against itself, but it's the very posing of the question whether or not a state and its legal apparatus are legitimate. There is actually no more violent thing one can do from the perspective of the legal regime at, that he's describing. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, it seems to me that this is a basic act of critical inquiry, or basic ask, act of posing the question of justification. The attribution of violence under such conditions and by such authorities thus establishes any act, even the posing of a question about violence that is not already within the obligatory framework established by and for legal violence as itself violent. Okay. At this point, we can see how something called critique, I, I kind of remember that term, there's something called critique in Benjamin's view, which queries the production and self-validation of schemes of justification, can easily be called violence. Indeed, for Benjamin, any inquiry, any statement, any action that calls into question the framework of legal violence within which the justificatory scheme is established will itself be called violent, and the opposition to such a fund fundamental form of querying, of asking the question, will be understood as a legal effort to contain and quash a threat to the rule of law. On the one hand, Benjamin offers us a way to debunk a spurious charge that a critical relation to a legal regime is by definition a violent one, even when it pursues nonviolent means. On the other hand, the position of critique, the one that does not accept the justificatory schemes established within and by the legal framework, is what he associates with what he calls divine violence, pure power over all life for the sake of the living, a power distinct from law, and that seems to have as its main aim the deconstitution of a legal regime. Oddly, divine violence includes forms of adamant non-action, like refusing to participate, strikes, failing to show up for work, refusing to take food, refusing to reproduce oneself as a subject in prison, uh, refusing to reproduce oneself as a subject bound by law. Whatever divine violence may be, and I cannot enter into this domain here because it, we would be here for several weeks, um, we never seem to be offered a definitive example, and he's very clear that there is no definitive example of divine violence. It, hovers about the example. Um, there seems to be a kind of interdiction on the image that defines di divine violence. Um, the only thing we really know about it is that it's not state violence, and that its aim is to deconstitute legal violence. 
If we follow Benjamin's analysis, we cannot quite start with a definition of violence and then proceed to debate under what conditions violence is justified or not. That is to make use of the very justificatory scheme about which we have to think historically and critically. The reason we cannot start that way is that violence is from the start defined within certain frameworks and comes to us always already interpreted or worked over by its frame. The historicity of that working over is congealed in the discursive framework within which violence appears, and that tends to be one in which legal violence, and we might add institutional or administrative forms of violence, are generally occluded. If one refuses to answer the question of which sorts of violence are justified and which are not, because one wants to call attention to the limited justificatory schemes that frame the question, then one risks a certain unintelligibility. One is told one is not practical. Or one comes to seem dangerous or as a kind of threat or as a nihilist. So on the one hand, as we can see radical critical inquiry into the legitimating grounds for a legal order, one that operates through legal violence, can be called violent acts. But that accusation works to suppress critical thought and ultimately serves the purposes of legitimating existing law. Is violence here the name given to those efforts to undermine and destroy prevailing institutions of legal violence? If so, it does not exactly serve to describe a set of actions, but to enforce a valuation upon them. And it does not much matter whether or not violence functions as a good description for whatever inquiry, action, or inaction is at issue. Whatever is called violence within this scene becomes regarded as violent from a particular perspective embedded in a defining framework. We might first presume that violence is physical, but if we do that, we fail to account for those kinds of violence that are linguistic, emotional, institutional, and economic, that undermine and expose life to harm or death but do not take the literal form of a blow. If irrigation systems are destroyed or if populations are abandoned to disease, are these not rightly understood as operations of violence? What about chokeholds and forcible detention, solitary confinement? The figure of the physical blow cannot describe the full spectrum of violence, and no one figure can. We could begin to construct typologies, as many people have, but the lines between types of violence tend to blur. My point here is that violence is always interpreted within a framework so that we cannot always agree on what constitutes its empirical instance. There are ways of renaming and failing to name the very same act that plague the moral and legal debates on violence. That does not mean that violence can be wished away or that it's a matter of subjective opinion. On the contrary, violence is precisely what is perpetually subjected to an oscillation of frameworks. And one can see how this works in Talal Assad's important analysis of death dealing. Some forms of death dealing are justified, glorified. Others are disparaged and condemned. Depending on the state, state-sanctioned violence is justified. Non-state-based violence is unjustified. Indeed, with the support of some versions of the state, the death dealing is said to be done in the, names of, in the name of justice and democracy. And in non-state-based violence, the death dealing is criminal or terrorist. Well, sometimes it is. But the methods may be similar or different, and their destructive power may be equal or equally horrific. And yet the fact that life is taken away in brutal forms within each framework does not always lead to the insight that there is a greater proximity among forms of death dealing than we might be led to expect. One might well consider established nonviolent tactics of resistance to legal or economic forms of exploitation or political forms of constraint, such as the strike, the hunger strike in prison, work stoppages, nonviolent forms of occupying government or official buildings or spaces or those whose private and public status is being contested, or boycotts of various kinds, including consumer and cultural boycotts, sanctions, but also public assemblies, petitions, ways of refusing to recognize illegitimate authority or declining to vacate institutions that have illegitimately been closed. What tends to unify such actions or inactions, depending on your point of view, um, is that they all call into question the legitimacy of a set of policies or actions, or even, in the case of the general strike, the legitimacy of a specific form of rule. And yet all of them, by virtue of calling for a change in police, state formation, or rule, can be called destructive, since they do not ask for 
since they do ask, rather, for a substantial alteration of the status quo, and they raise the question of legitimacy that becomes regarded as a violent act. When violence comes to name nonviolent forms of resistance to legal violence, then it becomes all the more important to situate that naming practice critically within political frameworks and their self-justificatory schemes. I, say this, uh, I see this not only as a task for contemporary critical theory, but for any self-reflective ethics and politics of nonviolence. While I take seriously Benjamin's claim that we have to think critically about how such justificatory schemes are established before we simply start operating within them, I also think that we are obligated to make decisions that commit us to certain frameworks. As much as we cannot decide whether or not violence is justified without knowing what counts as violent, we cannot give up on the demand to decide in the face of this problem. In other words, the operation of critique cannot preclude both commitment and judgment. Benjamin casts light on the question of whether any given action should be considered violent or nonviolent. The frame within which the question is posed determines in large part the way it is settled. The justificatory schemes produced by the law tend to reproduce its own legitimacy precisely in the way that, that settles that question. In the brief time remaining, I hope to take up uh, a related question, namely how we understand principled arguments in favor of nonviolence that tend to make exceptions for self-defense. And I think we see one form of self-defense operates in the, um, the police justification for the killing of unarmed black men or black people more generally. But I think we can also see states who uh, use self-defense uh, as a way of legitimating their own military aggression. Um, and yet self-defense seems to be an important term, and it's one to which many of us seek recourse uh, when we try to explain our own views on uh, nonviolence. So one question I have um, is, uh, how do we understand principled arguments in favor of nonviolence that tend to make ex exceptions for self-defense? Is it possible to have an ethics and politics of nonviolence that does not make an exception for self-defense? Is the term self-defense yet another way of framing violence such that its justifiable character comes to the fore? Some would argue that only force is used in the name of self-defense, but not violence. Can we hold to a stable distinction between force and violence? If self-defense constitutes an exception to the prohibition on violence, how are we to understand that exception? Through what discursive logic does it work? Does one have to have a particular kind of self, a valorized self, in order to be entitled to defend that self. Are there, for instance, defensible and indefensible selves? Moral philosophers and theologians have asked what grounds the claim that the interdiction against killing is wrong. The usual way of handling this question is to ask whether that interdiction, commandment, or prohibition is absolute, whether it has a theological or other conventional status, whether it is a matter of law or morality. It's invariably accompanied by a further question, namely whether there are bona fide exceptions to such an interdiction when injuring or even killing is justified. And then debates tend to ensue about what, if any, exceptions exist and what they indicate about the less than absolute character of that interdiction. Self-defense usually enters the debate at this juncture. The exception to the rule is important, perhaps more important than the rule itself, for instance, if there are exceptions to the prohibition on killing, and if there are always such exceptions, this suggests that the prohibition on killing is less than absolute. It's a prohibition that on occasion fails to assert itself or holds itself back or suspends its own powers of uh, restraint. Self-defense is, of course, a highly ambiguous term, as we can see in militaristic modes of foreign policy that justify attacks as self-defense. And in contemporary US law, uh, the stand your ground provisions that make provisions for preemptive killing. It can and in practice ex and does extend to the defense of loved ones, children or animals, or others who are considered close to you, relations that are part of one's broader sense of self. It therefore makes sense to ask what defines and limits those relations, uh, what elaborates the conception of the self to include groups of others in this way, and why are they usually understood as biological relatives uh, or those related through conjugal ties. And 
I'm aware that in discussions I have with friends and colleagues about um, uh, nonviolence, uh, I can ask the question, do you have a principled opposition to violence? And usually in my neighborhood, they say yes. And, um, and then, uh, but they say, but with an exception. And then, and then the question is, but of course, if someone attacked my child, I would hurt that person, I would even kill that person. Uh, and I said, well, what about uh, your sister? Yeah, oh, yeah, I would do that for my sister too. Uh, and your uncle Elmer, how do you feel about him? Well, he didn't give me a present last Hanukkah, right? So, and then, you know, the sister-in-law, well, she lives in Tennessee and I never see her. In other words, there's a kind of uh, moment, right, where one decides, like, whose life, whose life you would uh, be willing to kill to preserve, and whose life you just maybe they'll have to find another way. Um, in any case, um, I think it's it's important. Why? Because um, an arbitrary and dubious distinction emerges between those who are close to one, in the name of whose protection we make one may commit violence, even murder, and those who are at a distance from oneself, in the name of whom, in whose defense one may not kill. So. What and who is part of the self that you are and what relations are included under the rubric of the self to be defended? I would defend myself if attacked and I would defend this one who's close to me and this one who's close to me because they are part of my, my selfhood, my extended idea of selfhood, the kin relations or the close relations that are part of who I am intimately. If I defend myself and those who are considered part of myself or proximate enough so that I know and love them, then this self that I am is related to these others, yes, but the relations, the relations that belong to this self as I define it, are limited to those who are proximate and similar. So one is justified in using violence to defend those who belong, defend the lives of those who belong to that region of the self. I almost wrote regime of the self. Uh, some group is then covered by my expanded claims of self-defense and they're understood to be worthy of a violent protection against violence, a violence done to others so that it's not done to one's own. The interdiction against violence reemerges within the exception. Now it is that group composed of those who are not part of my region of the self, who threaten my group with violence, and against those I'm apparently justified in waging violence. The interdiction now is imposed on the other group, the one that is not my own, not to engage in violent acts. Absent that operative interdiction, I or we, are apparently justified in killing. When we get to that point in which one's one or one's group violently defends what it takes to be itself against violence, not only is a rather large and consequential exception made to the interdiction against violence, um, uh, but the distinction between the force of the interdiction and the violence interdicted starts to collapse. The exception to the interdiction opens up onto a situation of war in which it is always right to defend oneself or one's own, those who are close to you, violently, and in the name of an expanded self-defense, but certainly not a whole host of others who do not belong to oneself. And this means that there will always be those whose lives I do not defend, and there will always be those who seek to do violence to those whose lives are intricately bound up with my own, part of my extended region of the self. Um, um, uh, at such moments, the interdiction against violence proves to be less than absolute, to be sure, the exception to the interdiction becomes a potential state of war, or at least coextensive with war logic. Since if one will kill for this or that person who is proximate and affiliated, what finally distinguishes the proximate from the non-proximate, and under what conditions could that distinction be regarded as ethically justifiable? Of course, international human rights interventionists, what we used to call liberal hawks, in the United States would argue that, oh, well, what follows from what you're saying is that uh, we in the first world should be prepared to go to war for everyone. But my point is decidedly different. The exceptions to the norm of nonviolence actually begin to elaborate forms of group identification, even nationalism or racism, that result in a certain war logic. It goes like this. I am willing to defend those who are like me and only those who are like me or who might be understood as part of the generalized regime of this self that I am, but not those who are unlike me, which converts rather easily into the claim, I will defend only those who are like me, recognizable to me, but will defend against those who are not recognizable to me and with whom no ties of belonging seem to exist. 
or I will abandon that population, right? They're either the attacker against which I have to defend myself, or they're the ones who are left to be attacked or let to die. With these example, examples, um, one question I'm trying to pose is whether there's a norm that is invoked to distinguish those who belong to the group whose lives are worth saving and those who do not belong to that group and whose lives are not worth saving or defending. For implicit in the way the exception to the interdiction against violence works is that there are those who are understood to belong and to deserve protection against violence, whereas those who do not belong well in relation to them, I invoke my principle of nonviolence and I do not intervene on their behalf. Now, that may sound like a cynical way of putting things, but it's meant only to foreground the fact that some of our moral principles may well be already in the sway of other political interests and frameworks. The distinction between populations that are worth violently defending and those who are not implies that some lives are simply considered more valuable than others. So my suggestion has been to consider that the principle by which, con the principle by which conditions under which the exception to nonviolence are identified is at once a measure for distinguishing among populations. Those one is ready to grieve or do not qualify as grievable. Those one is prepared to grieve if something terrible were to happen and whose death ought in all instances to be forestalled. Those one is not prepared to grieve who do not live out a potentially grievable life and whose loss would not make a mark. So if we make exceptions to the principle of nonviolence, it shows that we're ready to fight to harm, even to murder, that we're prepared to give moral reasons for doing so. And according to this logic, one does this either in self-defense or in defense of those who belong to this proximate regime of the self with whom identification is possible or who are recognized to constitute the broader social or political domain of self selves to which one's own self belongs. And if that last proposition is true, that is, there are those I'm willing to hurt or murder in the name of those with whom I share a social identity or love or identify with in some way that is essential to who I am, then there is a moral justification for violence that emerges precisely on a demographic basis. So what's demography doing in the midst of a moral debate about exceptions to the interdiction against violence? Well, I've been suggesting simply that what starts as a moral framework for understanding nonviolence turns into a different kind of problem, a political problem. In the first instance, the norm we invoke to distinguish lives we're willing to defend and those that are effectively dispensable is part of a lar larger operation of biopower that unjustifiably distinguishes between grievable and ungrievable lives. But if we accept the notion that all lives are equally grievable and that the political world ought rightly to be organized in such a way that this principle is affirmed by economic and institutional life, then we arrive at a different conclusion and perhaps at another way to approach the problem of nonviolence. After all, if a life from the start is regarded as grievable, then every precaution will be taken to preserve and safeguard that life against harm and destruction. In other words, what we might call the radical equality of the grievable is what we uh, have to understand as the demographic precondition for an ethics of nonviolence that does not make the exception. I'm not saying that no one should defend oneself or that there are no cases where intervention is necessary, but rather than take up those hard cases individually, I would like merely to suggest that a thoroughly egalitarian approach to the preservation of life imports a perspective of radical democracy into the ethical consideration of how best to practice nonviolence. There is no difference between lives worth preserving and lives that are potentially grievable, which means that grievability governs the way in which living creatures are managed and proves to be an integral dimension of, bi of biopolitics, but also to our ways of thinking about equality among the living. My further claim is that this argument in favor of equality bears directly on the ethics and politics of nonviolence. A nonviolent practice may well include a prohibition against killing, but cannot be reducible to that prohibition. For instance, the response to a pro-life position, so-called pro-life position, is to argue first for the equal value of life and to show that the pro-life position is actually committed to gender inequality, generating a subject with the right to life while decimating the claims that women make to their own lives. Right. So the problem with it is not so much about deciding when and where life begins. The problem with it is that it is based on, on a principle of inequality. I understand that this leaves many questions unanswered, including 
the important question of whether we're referring only to human life, to cell tissue, embryonic life, or to all species and to living processes, including the ecological conditions of life itself. My point would be to rethink the relationality of life regularly covered over by typologies that distinguish forms of life. By relationality, I would include concepts of interdependency and not only those among living human creatures. For instance, human creatures living somewhere requiring soil and water for the continuation of life are also living in a world of non-human creatures whose claim to life clearly overlaps with the human one and where each are also sometimes quite dependent on one another for life as well. Those over overlapping zones of life, or the living, have to be thought as both relational and processual, but also, each of them, as requiring conditions for the safeguarding of life. Interdependency always raises that question of destructiveness that is a potential part of any living relation. And yet the social organization of violence and abandonment, crossing the sovereign and biopolitical operations of power, constitute the contemporary horizon in which we have to reflect upon the practice of nonviolence. If the practice remains restricted to an individual mode of life or decision making, we lose sight of that interdependency that produces the framework of equality as well as the risk of destructiveness. As a result, the ethical and political practice of nonviolence requires an opposition to biopolitical forms of racism and war logics that rely on phantasmagoric inversions that occlude the binding and interdependent character of social life. It requires as well an account of why and under what conditions the frameworks for understanding violence and nonviolence, or violence and self-defense, seem to invert into one another, causing confusion about how to best to pin down those terms. The practice of nonviolence has to confront all these challenges, and that can become a matter of despair. Right now, in Turkey, for instance, those who have signed a petition for peace are accused of terrorism. And in Palestine, those who seek a political form that guarantees equality and political self-determination are accused of destructiveness. Such allegations are meant to paralyze and undermine the advocate of nonviolence and to distort the position against war to distort anti-war positions as if they were nothing but a position within war. Now when that happens, uh, an anti-war position is taken to be a warring position, the critique of war is, con is construed as subterfuge aggression or dissimulated hostility. But why? Is it because no position can be imagined outside the frame of war? And that all positions, however nonviolent, emphatically nonviolent, are always and only permutations of violence? Here we see the paranoid logic returns. Perhaps as well, a form of critical patience is required in which the phantasmagoria that deny our mutual dependency are given a chance to deflate and scatter. It is not easy to refuse the phantasmagoric formulation that imagines that someone is attacking when they are not, or that someone is destroying when they are calling for peace. A phantasm has substituted for whoever is speaking and acting at that moment and those who fear them encounter destruction in this externalized figure. That form of defensive aggression is quite far from the insight that this life is not finally separable from another life, no matter what walls are built between them. With this last perspective, we might reapproach equality and cohabitation in new terms, starting from the presumption that all lives are equally grievable, and to see how that, that matters both in life and in death, for in life, the potentially grievable life is one that deserves a future, and it is one that belongs to those who seek to safeguard that future and, when necessary, mourn that life. Such an affirmation would, would prove to be quite different from self-preservation at the expense of others, fortified by figures of aggression that project the destructive potential in every social bond in ways that break the social bond itself. It's precisely because we can destroy that we are under an obligation to know why we ought not to do it. Nonviolence becomes a moral norm by which we are bound, against which we rail, and that it is our obligation to preserve. It establishes the vect social form of our lives. It leads us to ask whether self-preservation is not linked to preserving the lives of others and whether it has any meaning, self-preservation, without being linked to a commitment to preserve the lives of others. If self-preservation were the exception to principles of nonviolence, then who would that self be who preserves itself and only those who belong already to 
the regime of that self. Such a self stands worldless and it threatens this world. Thank you.